Number six is fair play. This is a very British thing. Again, um, we have invented a lot of sports and exported them around the world. But there is a notion in British culture that we should play these sports as fairly as possible, which has led to the uh, idea that we are a nation of losers because we've put this, not just the rules of the law uh, as premium, but also the spirit of the game um, as paramount. And sometimes this has resulted in the British losing at something which they were capable of winning because the rest of the world um, sees victory often in very different terms to the British. Now, that's not to say that the British aren't practitioners of various dark arts, but then the British didn't invent the dark arts. It's a defence against the dark arts in sport. Um, so this is exemplified uh, most recent in the most recent World Cup, where for years the British would play uh, football in a World Cup or in a European um, championship and um, the refereeing decisions would go against them and the marginal calls would go against them and any kind of um, foreign team that was prone to diving, rolling around and crying foul from ref would get uh, the benefit of the doubt at the cost of the stout yeoman-like British teams. But we've changed that in the last World Cup because now we're learning to play to the referee. So when uh, a foreign player jostles an English player, this was most evident in the last World Cup, um, the English player then goes with the momentum. It's not a dive, it's just that if they get a slight push, they're not going to push back, stand their ground, they're going to go with the momentum, go down, and a polite inquiry to the referee, I don't think that was very fair ref, do you? And we do it in a very British way, kind of... Okay, we're going to uh, protect ourselves against the dark arts of sport by twisting it, by showing up the original practitioner of the dark arts. And this sense of fair play extends to things like when we play Australia in the cricket, because Australia have a culture of winning, playing hard. And sometimes in Australian culture, the line between playing hard and playing honestly gets blurred and it happens uh, every generation there is some kind of scandal involving Australian sport um, but the British culture n dips its toe in but the the sense of revulsion that happens afterwards is very indicative that the British don't want our sportsmen and sportswomen to go down that route we are shifting slightly uncomfortable at just what goes on in our very successful cycling team. At some point, will British culture say, you know, it's it's great getting all these medals and Tour de France wins, but we don't want it at that cost. But there is a very um, British way of trying to maximise your winning potential in sport. And it's called gamesmanship, the, uh, based on the um, ideas of Stephen Potter which is the art of winning without actually cheating, but by just nibbling away at the stress levels of your opponent. Um, the axiom is the first muscle stiffened is the first point gained. And that's a very British response to um, winning in sport. It's that like maybe we can tinker around the edges of legality and fairness, but still always appearing to be the fair one. Now, speaking of sport and animals, let's move things on to number seven on my list of uh, British culture, and that is hobbies. We like sport. We've invented a great many hobbies. Now, the Germans, with their uh, fantastic uh, attention to precision and detail, have produced some of the greatest models um, anywhere in the world. Their model making skills and uh, the models themselves are second to none. But it took the British to say, well, how can we play with these models? You know, keep them in a static case. No, no, no. We've got to play with them somehow. So it's a very pretty thing to say, right, we've got these toy soldiers and we've got some slightly different toy soldiers. And let's have a battle between the two of them on this model landscape. And let's come up with some rules and um, let's regulate the whole thing with dice or with playing cards. See, we, we love the idea of hobbies, something that we do in our downtime. 
and uh, whether it's playing with little miniature figures or shaping hedges to look like ducks and butterflies to um, any number of uh, things that just enrich life but not necessarily are productive or profitable it's a very British thing so that's number seven hobbies now hobbies are often practiced in the home and the home is number eight on my list the British sense of having their own home their own space with a front door that they can either keep out the world or invite people in but on the terms of their choosing the saying is an Englishman's home is his castle well that applies to everybody in Britain and to him and her some of us live in flats or apartment buildings and the French brutalist architect Le Corbusier once said that the British will learn to live in uh, flats and apartments well that's partially true we can live in them but the idea is that we want to make the space our home we want to make it our own and have it styled in the manner of our choosing have the things that we want in that home and then extend it into the garden so the garden is a, is another thing that is a quintessentially british the idea that we take the, the backyard space and make it into something of beauty. Well, not my garden, it's always a work in progress. But the idea, I, I love a lovely garden. We like to sit out in the summer and uh, take advantage of our space. We've imported the uh, great flowers of the world and made them grow in Britain. Sometimes our gardens are nicer than the houses we live in. But it's very British to have a, a home that we can call our own, um, a, a portal to the outside world which we control, and an environment uh, reflected in our gardens which we can just relax and enjoy for its own beauty. Now, I'm wearing my wife's jumper and a Robin Hood hat to exemplify number nine on my list, which is eccentricity. The British are an eccentric people and uh, we celebrate this in our culture you see when you are expected to act out of a sense of duty that you have to be polite to everyone that there's a kind of stoicism and resilience to our character and that we are often prone to being violent on occasions to being very thoughtful and practical people we need a release from that and the eccentricity and our sense of humour is that release. It's what keeps us grounded and sane, that we can go away and be as odd as we like. And um, you have these very eccentric, wacky people out there. The English eccentric, or I would ex extend that to British eccentric. And I'm looking at you, Scotland, you've produced quite a few in your time. But the eccentricity is what makes our culture what it is and this is typified also in our sense of humor we have the rich language which enables us to crack puns in fact we've elevated punnery to an art form punning punnery you see what's the word but punning is an art form in uh, British culture and likewise we have um, absurdist humor the, the British because we have a sense of detachment and we can step back because we are quite stoic um, and we like to be rational. So we can step back, look at the world in a little bit more of a detached way. And we can see incongruous ideas and we can see two ideas that should not belong together. And we put them together and out of that comes comedy. That's what we do. That's what the basis of Spike Milligan and Monty Python, two of our greatest practitioners of absurdist humour, can do. And we have people who dress in a bizarre, odd manner and people who have weird hobbies and people who express themselves in ways that uh, most of the world can't quite understand. But here's the thing. Our politeness allows us to have this space for people to be just that little bit odd and we enjoy it. Finally, number 10 on my list of things that define British culture is style.
And style can mean so many things, but the British like to do things with a certain style. Take my all-time favourite British hero from history, the Duke of Wellington. It's not that he was a great general who won practically all his battles. No, it was the way he did it. Um, down to the man himself. He was a gentleman. He was a very smart dresser, although not ostentatious. But he had the perfect phrase for any situation. You just go and look up a list of the Duke of Wellington's quotes, no matter how bad it got on the battlefield or in his political life, he always found the right thing to say, which was both uh, a, a wonderful summary of what was going on, but also an inspiration to everyone around him. That's why people took the time out to note what he was saying. And that same sense of style of doing things, it goes to another great leader that Britain has produced, Winston Churchill, and another eminently quotable person. But the British sense of style, is, is, it's all about the way you do things. It's not enough to win. Pete Sampras could win Wimbledon over and over again through a very um, strong, mechanical, precise method of winning tennis matches. But we prefer the, the artiste, we prefer the McEnroe's, the... Um, the uh, Nadal's, um, the Andre Agassi's, and our own homegrown sporting heroes are expected to have a certain amount of style that goes with their ability. And we take this through into the sartorial sense as well. Whereas a lot of European culture has tended to focus on women's style, men's style in, in Britain is, is the forefront, really. The, the idea of the Savile Row suit with the Windsor Knot tie. It is a, a badge um, that is worn throughout the world that denotes someone as being British to have the immaculately cut and smart suit. Again, not ostentatious, not showy, perhaps not the, the height of fashion, but a classic fashion and style that l endures over decades, over centuries. This is typified by James Bond himself. What Bond wears, people sit up and pay attention. And that was a facet of the books and the films as well, to present Bond a certain way that marks him out as a British gentleman, a man of impeccable style and taste. You see, that's the whole thing about British style. It's got to be in good taste. And we've concentrated, you know, the men's fashion side of it is something that has been concentrated on um, over the decades and the centuries, ever since perhaps the time of Beau Brummel. We have to present the men as, as people who can make their way in the world with complete confidence and style, that people will look up to somebody in a well-made English suit. But in terms of women's fashion, whereas you would look again um, thinking of the uh, French and Italian um, style centres and French haute couture, um, the women, the models, are kind of like the framework in which the outfit is placed on them and the outfit is, is it all uh, at the expense of the personality of the person wearing it. Take, for example, the Coco Chanel suit, um, very much a fashion icon. But it had the effect of making women look uniform and you don't really get the personality that comes along with it. In terms of British women's uh, fashion, what was happening in the 60s was that uh, the British designers were trying to um, make the personality of the wearer, of the woman wearing the clothes, come through. Now, here's a challenge. Can you name any model that's come up through the haute culture, the French, um, Italian continental style, models that come through through the ranks there. And you're probably thinking Claudia Schiffer, and that's pretty much the only name I can think of. But when you think of British uh, fashion icons, models, we've got Twiggy, we've got Kate Moss, uh, we've got um, those who weren't born in the UK, but came to the UK and became uh, fashion icons in the modelling world, like um, Peggy Moffat, um, and uh, my all-time favourite British model, Jean Shrimpton. <sighs> but anyway, I digress. But the thing is, is that the 
British fashion designers were trying to make the person wearing the clothes more important than the clothes. The clothes would complement the person wearing the clothes. And our great contribution to women's fashion in history is the miniskirt. And the miniskirt was meant to be a personal statement of the wearer. It could be worn in a variety of ways in a number of situations, but the personality of the person wearing it would always come through. And it would never, it would never diminish the, the wearer. The, you know, you didn't have to be uh, amazingly good looking or perfectly proportioned to be a British fashion icon. Your personality had to be reflected in your attire. And also following on from this kind of style ethos, let's talk about jet bombers now, because that's what we do here. Now, you have um, two of the greatest jet bombers ever designed. The American B-52, which is functional, which is practical, is probably the greatest single um, bomber ever created, but it's functional. It's not a style icon. It's not a head turner. It's there to shock and awe, and it has a practical purpose. Now, the British had a jet bomber that did the same thing as a B-52, called the Avro Vulcan. But the Avro Vulcan is gorgeous. It is a head turner. Um, it's a weapon of mass destruction, to be sure. but in its retirement, when it no longer has to carry any weapons, you can look at it and appreciate its styling and its beauty. And when it was flying, it was a wonder to behold. And that is what British style is. So, having linked the miniskirt to the Avro Vulcan jet bomber, I think my work is done here. I hope you've enjoyed this list. If you can think of anything else um, that is quintessentially... Uh, culturally British, do leave them in the comments section below. And no, I don't mean just getting drunk and having a fight. But anyway, a very Merry Christmas to you all, and I will see you later.